Wow, I'm in Atlanta. Came from New York yesterday. There's a difference between New Yorkers and Atlanters, I can tell you. And I prefer the Atlanters. Um, I arrived yesterday by plane, and um, thanks to the generosity of the McEver chair, they put me in a residence inn, and I had a big bed, and it was all for myself. And I'm going to read you a poem that will make you understand why I was so excited to have a big bed all for myself. This is called After a Noisy Night. The man I love enters the kitchen with a groan. He just woke up his hair a Rorschach test. A minty kiss, a hand on my neck, coffee, 2% milk, microwave. He collapses on a chair, stunned with sleep, yawns, groans again, and complains about his dry sinuses and crusted nose. I want to tell him how much he slept, how well. The cacophony of his snoring, pumping in long wheezes and throttles, a debacle of rhythm, hours erratic with pants and puffs, gulps, chokes, pectoral sputters, and spits. <laughs> but the microwave goes ding, a short little ding, sharp as a guillotine, and loud enough to stop my words from killing the moment. And during the few seconds it takes the man I love to open the microwave, stir, sip, and sit there staring at his mug, I remember the vows I made to my pillows, to fate, and to God. I'll stop eating licorice, I'll become a blonde, a lumberjack, a Catholic, anything but bring me a man. So I go to him. Sorry, honey. I'm sorry you had such a rough night. Hold his gray head against my heart and kiss him. Kiss him. Um, for a little while, my husband and I uh, taught in another town um, in America, and I'm not going to name it because maybe there's one person here who's from that town, but it was a very academic town full of very serious academic poets. And they had dinners <laughs> and receptions. And this is a poem about that. Dinner at the Who's Who. Amid swirling wine and flickers of silver, guests quote Dante, Brecht, Kant, and one another. I wait in the hall after not powdering my nose, trying to recompose that woman who will graciously take her place at the table and will not tell her hosts, I looked into your bedroom and closets. I smelled your obsession and brute. I sat on your bed. I imagined you in those spotless sheets. Looked into the long, looked long into the sad eyes of your son staring at your walls from a velvet frame. And I tried to smile at myself in your mirrors, wondering if you smile that way too, those resilient little smiles, one smiles at oneself before facing the day or another long night ahead, guests coming for dinner. So I wait in this hall, because there are nights it's hard not to blurt out enough. Stop that Pulitzer, Wall Street, PC, Dante, sex, wars, have some Chianti. Let's stop. Let's talk. 
about our thirsts and obsessions, our bedrooms and closets, the brutes in our mirrors, the eyes of our sons. There is time yet. Let's talk. I'm starving. <laughs> I want to thank Tom, Thomas Lux, who was my teacher about 20 years ago, I think. I moved from Belgium, wanted to write poetry in English, and he was my teacher. And um, actually, I dedicated this book to him because I owe him so much. And I want to thank you, Bruce. And I want to tell you how happy I'm going to, I am to be reading with you and you, Opal. them a giver jail. I mean, wow. Um, for those here who know um, poetry, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little redundant, but I'll be short. You know there, are, there is a form called sonnets. Those are 14 line poems. But there's also something called the double crown of sonnets. And the subtlety there is that the first line of a sonnet, no, the last line of a sonnet becomes the first line of the next sonnet, and the, then its last line becomes the first line of the next one, etc. And I wrote a crown of sonnets. Don't worry, I'm not going to read 14 poems. Don't worry. But I'd like to read three of them, but you will hear that there's a, a repetition going on, and that's because it's a crown. She listens to music, eyes closed, hands joined, headset lost in thick black curls. A button on her jean jacket reads, still against the war. <laughs> Next to her on the bus, a small boy frowns, mouthing something to his plastic police car. Now and then, he looks up at an older woman who's been staring at them for a while. That's all I'll ever know about them. All I'll ever know is that we traveled a few blocks together and nothing happened. What thoughts they had, what the child mouthed, what, woman, what music the woman listened to, insignificant, right? It was only me thinking the boy wanted to shoot his class bully from that cop car, right? Or imagining the older woman was a racist and the other a dreamer. What would you have seen? What would you have thought? What would you have seen? What would you have thought watching those two men crossing the Brooklyn Bridge, shrill shirts ballooning, trying to understand each other, hands swooping up the air like gulls. That the poets gave each other wisdom or love or even a good time isn't the point. It's that no one crossing them on the bridge that day recognized them or stopped in awe to watch Crane and Lorca walk by. No one noticed Crane and Lorca walk by. They weren't stars, presidents, pitchers, or popes, after all. Only two men standing with empty hands in the murmur of the river's mouth. The two greatest poetic geniuses alive meet. And what happens? What did they see? What did they talk about, feel, or think then, as around them the air, clouds, and water went on, shuffling chance and light? <laughs>